Okay, good morning, everyone. Let's uh, dive in. A uh, little bit of scheduling first before we get started. Uh, I feel like we're barely going to see each other in March. Seems we've got a lot of, a lot of vacation coming up, which is maybe okay. A little bit of time to rest and recharge. Uh, this coming Thursday, I will not be here. Uh, one of my PhD students, Atusa Parsa, uh, will be here. It's a guest lecture. There's no required reading for that day. Uh, Atusa will spend uh, the first half telling you a little bit about her research. I will not steal Atusa's thunder, but uh, Atusa has figured out how to make a computer out of non-traditional parts, not digital electronics, uh, not analog electronics, something else entirely. In order to get this exotic material, which she'll introduce you to uh, on Thursday, to compute, to act as a computer, she evolved this material to act increasingly like a computer. Uh, I will leave the rest to Atusa to tell you about. Uh, the, second half, uh, the second half of her guest lecture, it'll be sort of an open Q&A. She'll tell you a little bit about uh, her journey to uh, get here and become a PhD student, what it's like to be a graduate student, what it's like to be research, what, uh, to do research, what it's like to apply to grad schools. So for those of you that are thinking about possibly going on to grad school, uh, think on the questions that you have and please ask Atusa about them. I think uh, we've done this in previous years. It's always been very successful. Obviously hard to decide for all of you whether you want to go into industry or continue on with graduate work if you don't have any experience being a graduate student or doing research. So uh, you'll be able to speak with Atusa who's on the front lines of all that. And uh, yeah. And then I will not be back the following Tuesday. Neither of us will be here on Tuesday. It will be town hall meeting day. But we will continue on with the assignment uh, with the assignments as usual. So I'll post assignment eight for the undergraduates uh, for next Tuesday. Everything is still due as usual. Okay, then we will see each other next Thursday uh, to, to discuss, start discussing some of the open problems or challenges uh, in evolutionary robotics. Then we're off the following week for spring recess, and then we will gradually get back to our regular schedule. Yeah. Uh, sorry, one other point. So with our guest lecturer uh, on Thursday, there's no required reading. There will also be no quiz uh, this Thursday. Yeah. Okay. Any questions about schedule, upcoming events? All good? Okay. So uh, uh, undergraduates, you're now working on assignment seven. Uh, you're working on, you'll be starting in on assignment uh, seven. Graduate students, you will be submitting uh, you will be submitting next. Uh, you will be submitting next Tuesday. Or sorry, next Monday at 11:59 p.m. You will be submitting the first of your nine weekly reports, where the goal is to show, basically show rather than tell. Upload images or videos like you've been doing all along. Just copy and paste directly into your Blackboard submission a, a sentence or two, reminding us about what you were trying to achieve for that week and what we should be looking for in your images or video that prove that you've implemented or taken that first baby step towards your final project. I think that's pretty straightforward. All good? Any questions about the assignments? No? Okay, so we are closing in on the end uh, of our uh, potted history here of evolutionary robotics. We're in our subsection here on locomotion. We talked about last time how getting from point A to point B is an extremely challenging thing for animals and machines to do. It requires some pretty complex machinery to be able to figure out what to do and deal with the massive amount of sensory change that occurs the moment that the animal or the machine acts. So we're looking at, in these two lectures, and arguably all of the lectures that will follow, we're looking at le uh, locomotion as sort of the fundamental cognitive building block. And then on top of that, on top of legged, loco uh, legged locomotion or other forms of locomotion, we start layering increasingly abstract building blocks of cognition, many of which we looked at in the minimal cognition experiments. Yeah. OK. We saw last time by, uh, we saw last time why, uh, Several reasons why legged locomotion in particular is challenging. One reason is that we, as legged locomotors, need to strike a trade-off 
between at least four desiderata, four things that are important as we move about from place to place. What are those four? Stability, Stability. Robustness. robustness, what are we missing? Displacement. Displacement, we've got to actually get from point A to point B. Fourth one? Energy. Energy, which we as bipeds are particularly good at. And we're going to see that when we talk about biped locomotion uh, in a few minutes when we finish up this le lecture on legged locomotion. OK, we ended by looking at uh, Big Dog last time, which runs on a diesel engine. And in the, when it slips on the ice in this particular video, it's carrying about 325 pounds on its back. This is not something I would recommend. What what, what, how is Big Dog striking, what, what trade-off is Big Dog making between displacement, energy, stability, and robustness? What is it particularly good at in terms of those four things, and what is it not so good at in terms of those four things? It's pretty stable, and this was a big challenge in legged lo uh, robotics for arguably 30 or 40 years before Boston Dynamics dropped this video. Basically, Boston Dynamics seems to have solved this stability problem. It's pretty stable. So it's pretty good at stability, not so good at, or it's taking a hit in terms of energy, energy right? The diesel, the diesel engine, not, not very efficient. Yeah? OK. Uh, has anybody heard of Big Dog Beta? I left the link in there for you. For those that want to have a look later, we'll have a quick look. This followed shortly after as a arguably arguable improvement over Big Dog Alpha. Alpha. What's the improvement? There's no e there, there's no diesel engine, that's right. You want to make a quadruped? Just glue two bipeds together. Not bad, eh? There's 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 big dog beta. Okay. Humans are pretty stable too. Not bad. Uh, not great, but not bad. Okay. All right. You know you've made it in robotics when somebody makes a spoof video of your robot video. Okay. All right, so the preamble in this part of the lecture, we were looking at sort of these trade-offs, the various ways of striking these trade-offs in animals and machines. Obviously, if we talk about legged locomotion, there's an infinite number of ways that you can create a legged machine or a legged, legged organism that uh, gets from point A to point B. What is this relationship between morphology, the, the body plan of the animal, or the machine, Big Dog Beta is still running here. Hold on a second. There we go. OK. What is the relationship between morphology, the actual geometry of the, robot, of the animal or the robot's body, its distribution of sensors and motors, its neural controller, its stability, its energy, its displacement? There's all these different sort of phenomena that come together to produce or fail to produce legged locomotion. So. Many, many years ago now, 21 years ago when I was just starting out, I worked with Rolf Pfeiffer and we wrote uh, the following paper, which we're going to look at in the remainder of this lecture, which is, was an attempt to try and isolate what aspects of morphology influence the ability to evolve legged locomotion. So for many of you, you're sort of tackling, you're, you're probably going to tackle in your final project some smaller version of this project create a, a quadruped, create a hexapod, create a neural network controller for both, and then run your evolutionary algorithm on both for eight hours on the quadruped, eight hours on the hexapod. Which, which of these two body plans is it easier for the evolutionary algorithm to produce fast locomotion for? Yeah. Here, was our, here was my attempt uh, at this problem year, years ago now. You'll notice we've got 10 different, uh, 10 different robots here. They have very different bodies. I tried as best I could in this experiment to make everything else 
about the robots exactly the same. So although they have different bodies, they all have exactly the same number of sensors and motors. They all have exactly the same neural network, as I'll show you in a moment. I'm going to use the same fitness function for all of these robots, which is just going to evolve them to move as quickly as possible in a fixed period of time. And I'm going to use the same optimizer on all 10 of these robots. I'm going to use exactly the same uh, evolutionary algorithm. And we're going to see which of these 10 robots did the evolutionary, was the evolutionary algorithm able to evolve fastest locomotion for. Assuming that the evolutionary algorithm has the same computational budget for all 10 of the robots. We're going to evolve the same size, the same population size of neural networks. We're going to evolve each of these 10 robots for the same number of evolutionary uh, generations. And let's see what happens. Yeah. It's probably going to be difficult for those of you in the back to see. You'll have to look at the slides after, uh, after class. But there are a number of tags on all of these robots. There's a number of M's, A's, and T's. The T's correspond to touch sensors. So in the quadruped here, robot number three, there's one touch sensor in this foot, one touch sensor in this foot, one touch sensor in this foot, one touch sensor in this foot. We've got four touch sensors. There are eight motors. There's one motor controlling the upper leg and one motor controlling the lower leg. So basically a shoulder and a knee. We've got four legs, so four times two is eight. We've got eight motors. So there's eight M's sprinkled around this image. And there are also eight A's sprinkled around this image, which are meant to represent angle sensors. So on every motor, I have also placed uh, an angle sensor. Uh, so I'm sorry, there's only four, uh, four angle sensors. So I took four of the eight motors and I put angle sensors on them. That gives us a total of eight sensors for all of these robots. Each robot has four touch sensors somewhere on its body, four angle sensors on four of its eight motors, and we've got the eight motors down here. All 10 of these robots have exactly this cognitive architecture. This is the way their neural networks are wired up. This should look pretty familiar to you by now. We've got our sensor neurons here, our motor neurons down here. Our, I've got three hidden neurons here. And we've got recurrent connections among all the hidden neurons in case memory or short-term memory is useful for these robots to locomote. Two new types uh, of neurons for you are the bias neurons here. We haven't seen bias neurons before. Bias neurons just always emit a value of one. You'll see there's no incoming arrows to the bias neurons. They always output a value uh, of one. They have outgoing uh, arrows. So we wire up this bias neuron, this bias neuron to these hidden neurons, this bias neuron to these motor neurons, and evolution is going to tune all of the weights that you see here. Why, why bias neurons? What use might they have? Anybody have any ideas? If you had your robot then making a massive jump, you could have it make some of these small movements by maybe less than one bias. Uh, we could. The, the bias is, is always set to one. We never change the value of the bias neuron. It's always one. Other ideas? Maybe you use it to address the base value of what a motor that you always want to be on on some level or something like that. Absolutely, right? So this bias neuron that's connected to these motor neurons, assuming evolution sets these synaptic weights to a magnitude sufficiently far from zero, there's always going to be a bias for these motor neurons. They're always going to be trying to reach some non-zero value. That can be useful in some cases. What about this one up here? What would happen, what would happen for any of these robots as they're moving about in their simulated environment if these, all of these sensor values happen to be zero or near zero. Perhaps the robot has jumped off the ground and the four touch sensors are zero. 
and the angles of these four uh, motors or these four joints happen to be near the starting angle, which when we talked about physical simulation is zero. Assuming that like the recursions in the second layer are super strong, it would quick like send all of the values to zero? Absolutely. So if all of these values are zero or very near zero, and again, it depends on what's going on with the re recurrent connections, it's very difficult it's most likely that the hidden neurons then are also going to be very close to zero. Remember that when we compute neuron values, we're computing the incoming weighted sum, right? This neuron times this weight plus this neuron times this weight and so on. If all of these values are zero, the weighted sum of zero is going to be near zero. So bias neurons are often added into a neural network so that if its entire input layer happens to be near zero, that doesn't mean that the other layers are going to immediately collapse towards zero as well. You can think about the robot sort of, it's jumped off the ground, so all touch sensors have gone to zero, and suddenly without a bias neuron, the only thing it can do is freeze and not move its, not move its uh, motors. All the motors go to zero because there's no bias neuron. <laughs> if you're running and throw yourself in the air, one of the worst things you can do is freeze, right, and not prepare for impact. Yeah. So by adding in this bias neuron, like we saw with the C tier and ends, we're giving, we're giving the evolutionary algorithm an alternate path. It could, by evolving these weights, it can deal with those kinds of situations. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Time to take some bets. I'll show you the data in a moment. Which one? Which one, when we ran the evolutionary algorithm on all 10 of these, which one evolved to move the fastest for the same fixed period of time in the simulation? We're going to evolve them in a simulated world, infinite flat, flat plane, like you all have uh, in your code base. Given our discussion last time about biomechanics, the bio biomechanics of legged locomotion, what do you think? I have a question about sure. the experiment. When you ran them, did it seem like, like obviously it's hard to know if you're actually meeting the global maxima, ah. but when, like if you're, are, are they, did they seem to be mostly towards the maximum, like local maxima? Great question. So what's the global maximum here? What is the fastest that these machines could actually move? Given the motors and all the, all the other details that we build into the simulation, what's the, mac, what's the global maximum? What's the fastest they could possibly move? And then when we evolved these robots, how close to, did we get to the maximum? The answer to your first question is, we don't know what the global maximum is, right? Remember back to our discussion about evolutionary algorithms? If we knew what the global maximum is, we'd set the weights to that global maximum and be done. We don't know how fast these machines can go. How fast can a human being run for, let's say, 30 seconds? What's the absolute fastest a human can run over 30 seconds? Nobody knows. I don't know what the current world record is, but it's changed over time. Hard to know, right? Hard to know. So all I can do is show you what the evolutionary algorithm came up with. The evolutionary algorithm is climbing the hill, is climbing the fitness landscape for each of these 10 robots, 10 separate fitness landscapes. All 10 of these fitness landscapes are covered in fog. We cannot see the peak. We cannot see the global maximum. We don't know what it is. All we can do is tell the evolutionary algorithm to try and move up local slopes. So like, but when, when you looked at that, like, say you ran it for 100 generations, was generation 90 to generation 100 sort of a large jump? Ah, oh, good these, question. Because yep. like, see. to me, some of them, you might want to evolve a more complex gate, which would be faster, but that might take take longer, take more generations. Great question. So yep. I was just wondering if you, if you, you know, because if, if you chop it at, you know, 10 generations, yep. some of the more simple ones that just have an accidentally decent gate would out on top. That's a great question. So for some of these robots that are simpler, it might take the evolutionary algorithm less time, less, evolu uh, less generations to find a fast gate, and then it can't squeeze any more speed out of them, so fitness starts to plateau over evolutionary time. 
For others, for some of the more complex robots, evolution might just be warming up. Fitness might still be increasing by the time we stopped the experiment. I will show you 10 fitness curves in a moment and you can judge for yourself. Yeah? So we could recast this experiment and say, if we ran this, if we ran all 10 robots for a million generations, now who's the best? Yeah? I'll tell you, we ran this, I, I can't remember, it's 100 or 200, we'll see in a moment. It was enough time. It was enough time for most of these robots. Ideas? I saw a hand up over here before. <laughs> Number nine, I hear one vote for nine. Anyone else for nine? I'll take numbers. Nine or ten, okay. Ten, okay. It's not quite a biped, it's a triped, but uh, it's the closest to us we have. So, all right, a little anthro chauvinism here. Other, other votes? I'll take two. Two, okay. Why two? Looks like a dog. Looks like a dog, okay. I'll take three. Three, okay. For those of you that have reached the final project, you're building number three. So that's a bit of a hint. Not necessarily that three is the best here. Other, other votes? You'll take one, okay. Anybody else? Six? Yeah. Why not? Okay. Anyone else? Going once, going twice. Okay. Let's look at some data. I will show you the fitness curves in a moment. Before we get to the fitness curves, these are footprint graphs. These are uh, an, a useful visualization. You might use this in your final project as well. The, foot, the footprint graph does not show us how far the robots evolved to move. It shows us how the evolved robots moved. I did multiple evolutionary runs for all 10 robots, and then among those multiple evolutionary runs for each of the 10 robots, I took the robot, or sorry, the controller, the set of synaptic weights that caused that particular robot to move the fastest. I took that controller, dropped it back into that particular robot, and then watched how that robot moved and produced that footprint graph. So what you're looking at are the footprints left behind by 10 evolved robot, the best robot from each of these 10, among these 10 robots. Yeah. Each row inside each individual footprint graph corresponds to one of the body parts that came into contact with the ground. Some of these robots have obvious feet, some are not not obviously feet. Whatever came into contact with the ground, that got its own row in this visualization. What do the columns represent? It's like time, step. time step in the simulation. So each of these robots was simulated for 500 time steps. A black pixel represents that that body part touched the ground at that point in time in the simulation. A white pixel, that body part was off the ground at that particular time step. What happened? Tell me about these evolved gates. I, I, I'll skip back and forth here so you can remind yourself of what they look like. Seems like, at least for most of them, they have a pretty repeating pattern, which to me would suggest that they actually evolved a gate of some kind? They've evolved a gate, so there's definitely regular motion. Yeah. If you want to move quickly, moving in an irregular way without any obvious oscillation, not a very good strategy. It's also energy inefficient to move without a regular pattern. Although, in this case, we were not evolving for energy efficiency. The, the motors could apply as much force as they wanted to get these machines to move. And in pretty much all 10 cases, the best machine had a regular oscillatory gait. What can you tell me about some of these gates? What's happening? It looks like six is just jumping along. Six? Looks like it's jumping along. You'll notice that there are particular periods in time. If we cut, if we cut vertically down through panel six here, there are periods in which there are all white pixels. What does that tell you about the robot? What's happening? 
it's off the ground, which is the the flight phase, right? So six is running or possibly hopping. So what else is happening among these machines? There's a pretty big variation between like how long they have their feet on the ground. Like number nine is like constantly like shuffling it or something. Like it's like its feet are almost never on the ground. And then number ten is like its feet are almost always on the like almost it like. It has two feet on the ground for most of the time, and then it has like one foot on the ground for some of the time, and then it goes back to two. Yeah, so the, exactly. So within a gait cycle, meaning when the gait starts until it repeats again, there are periods within that gait cycle in which there are very short periods of one body part on the ground and longer periods. So within a single gait cycle, there isn't a lot of regularity, or it's sort of uneven in some cases. Number nine, as you'll see, has a lot of flight phase. This thing is sort of throwing itself through the air. Any other observations? Anybody want to change their bets? We haven't seen speed yet. No? OK. Again, this experiment is 21 years old, so I apologize for the, qual the quality of these videos. Here's robot number six, the hexapod, which is the best evolved gate we got, if this will play. Any insect fans here? This is not how six-legged uh, insects tend to move. What's the preferred gait for insects? Anybody know? It's the alternating triangle gait. Front left foot on the ground, middle right foot on the ground, back left foot on the ground, and then switch. Right front, middle left, back. Whatever this six-legged machine is doing, it's not the alter alternating triangle gait. Here's uh, one of the qu quadrupeds. This is clearly a quadrupedal gait, pr pretty rare in nature. Why? Or statically stable? It's not statically stable, yep, so it rocks up on its two right legs or it rocks up on its two left legs. Any other reasons why this might be rare in nature? Why do quadrupeds tend not to like to move like this, generally speaking? You'll notice that its center of mass has to rock left and right quite a bit. For animals that are trying to go forward, that's lost energy, right? If you're using energy to throw your weight to the left and then catch your weight and throw it back to the right, it's very, very wasteful. You know? Okay, here's the tripod. It's like it's walking on crutches, right? I can't remember who placed a bet on the tripod. <coughs> Sorry. We talked at the beginning of this lecture about peristaltic motion. Here's one of the two snakes. It's not quite peristalsis, but it's close. This traveling wave moving along the body, moving backwards along the body, pushing the robot, uh, pushing the machine forward. In this case, the travel there is a traveling wave, kind of. It's mostly propelling forward. When we evolve machines, we often get back things that kind of look like and kind of don't look like things we see in nature. Yeah. Okay, I'm about to do the big reveal. Any, any last changes and bets? All good? Going once, going twice? Okay, 200 generations. We evolved all of these machines for 200 generations. Robots six, 
two, and three, arguably tied for first. Then there was a clumping one, nine, four, eight, ten, and then five and seven were trailing. So I'll flip back and forth between this slide and so there's five and seven. So the the peristaltic movers didn't do very well at all for some reason. And then six, two, and three. There's two and three and six. So these two quadrupeds, not this quadruped, these two plus the hexapod did very well. Why? They have a lot more freedom in choosing a gate because they're going to be stable in a lot more cases. So four and six legs are pretty good because you kind of have a, one or a couple legs in reserve, right? Remember that to stay stable, you need to keep your center of mass over your polygon of support. So if you're hex, a hexapod, and even if you lift three of your legs off the ground, you've got three still on the ground. That's going to describe some sort of triangle of support on the ground. Whatever that triangle is, it's not that difficult to get your, for the hexapod to get its center of mass over that triangle. Same thing with these machines. I still don't know why this one isn't, isn't doing as well. But generally speaking, it's relatively easy for these to stay stable and evolution to then tune the weights to speed things up. Yeah? Very difficult uh, for, legged, uh, for bipedal or even tripedal lo locomotion to evolve because evolution has to solve two problems simultaneously. Get the animal or the machine to move while also not falling over. Not, not so easy to do. Yeah. Other observations here before we move on. One of the main observations to take away is that these curves don't all overlap one another. Morphology matters. The way the machine is put together makes it much harder or much easier for the AI, in our case an evolutionary algorithm, to optimize useful behavior into that machine. Yeah? Okay. So in trying to understand what it is about the body that makes it easier or harder to evolve gates for it, I took certain features of those body plans and plotted them along the horizontal axis. So the first thing I thought is maybe the machines that are bigger and heavier would have a harder time moving. I forgot to mention when I introduced these robots, each body part has a, a unit mass of one. So the parts, the robots that have more parts are heavier. So the, uh, which one is it here? It's the hexapod, I think. The hexapod actually has 41 parts. So it has a mass of 41. Uh, robot number one, that simple quadruped, uh, only has 15 parts, so it has, it's much lighter. It has a mass of 15. And I plotted on the vertical axis here, among all those evolved, uh, among all the evolved controllers for that machine, how far did those evolved controllers get that machine to move? So higher is better, higher is faster. You can see there's kind of a trend. So basically, the heavier the machine is, the slower, uh, the, the, uh, slower it moved when it was evolved. But there were three notable exceptions to this rule. So mass doesn't explain everything. We just talked about stability. So I looked at that as well. Here's the tripod over here that only has three points of contact with the ground. And over here, five and seven, these are the two worms that have 10 possible points of contact with the ground. These machines over here are less stable. These machines over here, much more stable. Again, there's kind of a trend. It looks like there's a sweet spot. If you're too stable, if you're too unstable, like the tripod, it's easy to fall over. If you're too stable, you've got too many points of contact with the ground, it might take the evolutionary algorithm a lot of time to fi figure out how to orchestrate all of those feet, all of those legs to get things to move. In the middle here, these are the quadrupeds and the hexapods. 
that it was relatively easy for the evolutionary algorithm to evolve for. Yeah? So whatever the answer is, there doesn't, I haven't found it yet, there isn't a single feature of the body plan that predicts how much, uh, how much that feature will obstruct or facilitate the evolution of adaptive behavior for that machine. Okay, last, uh, the last part of this experiment that I conduct conducted is, what if we change the brain? We've got different bodies, they all have the same brain. What happens if we redo this experiment all over again, but now we give all 10 machines again the same brain, but a bigger brain? If they have more neural real estate, will they evolve to move faster? So let me go back to the brain for a moment. In the original experiment, they all had three hidden neurons. I expanded this to five hidden neurons, five hidden neurons, and ran them all again. Here's robots one through 10 along the horizontal axis here. The gray bars, the heights of the gray bars represent how well evolution, how fast evolution could get these machines to move. Dark gray bars is how fast evolution could get these robots to move with bigger brains. What happened? Was it useful? Exactly. So they all they all got better. They all evolution used that additional neural real estate to squeeze more speeds out of these machines somehow. But as you mentioned, it doesn't explain why some move faster than others. Some of them got like a lot faster with their nerves, but some of them got a little bit faster. Some got a lot faster. Which ones? Five and seven. Five and seven, which were the the snake ones. Why did the snakes, why do you think the snakes got a lot faster when we gave them more neural real estate? Because it's what we were just talking about with the uh, too many points of contact where they didn't have enough hidden neurons to really orchestrate a um, complicated system of emissions. Absolutely, right? So it's no trivial matter to get all of these 10 legs to move in the right way, whatever the right way is, yeah? And so that extra neural real estate was particularly useful. Are the, um, if you look at like the, the fitness curves? Yep. Do they plateau later in the generation? Good question. I don't remember if I have that data. I think the only plot I made is this one. It's a great question. Some of you might want to carve off a piece of this experiment and re-implement it and try it, try it yourself. Okay, so yes, I, they all got better, but some got better than others, yeah? Presumably because that extra neural real estate is useful for orchestrating the movement of all of these legs, yeah? The main takeaway I took away from these experiments when we finished them is it's complicated. There are lots of relationships, not just between the four desiderata of movement, stability, energy, displacement, and robustness. But those trade-offs are influenced by the type of body you have, the type and distribution of sensors, the type and distribution of motors, your cognitive architecture, how your sensors are wired up to your motors. There's a lot of interrelationships here that matter. They make it easier or harder for us to squeeze whatever desired behavior we want out of machines. Yeah? This is something that's missing from traditional robotics. We take big dog, we take the humanoid form, we've been working with, on dog bots and human bots for decades and decades. The bodies haven't changed much. We just fix that and then try and train those machines to do whatever we want them to do. Maybe that wasn't re the right choice. Maybe big dog isn't the most appropriate body plan for whatever it is we want that particular machine to do. Maybe it would be better to tune body, brain, cognitive architecture, sensor distribution, motor distribution, let evolution do what evolution did best in nature, tune all of these subsystems together to produce a desired result. Yeah? Okay. 
All right, let's move on now to the form of locomotion that we are all most familiar with, bipedal locomotion. Most of us only exhibit two gates, and most of us as we get older tend to favor just one of these two gates. But there are lots of other ways we can move. Please tell me that I don't have to explain who or what this video is. There's a gate. Who are we looking at? Please tell me I'm not that old yet. No? Thank you. John Cleese, Monty Python. This is the skit called The Ministry of Silly Walks. Here's the minister of silly walks on his way in the morning uh, to his ministry. Uh, if, you've ever, if you know anything about England, uh, the way their government is set up, they have a ministry for everything. So somewhere there must be a ministry of silly walks. There's the minister, some of his colleagues. Some a little more silly than others. Somebody mentioned dignity last time, right? That's a good reason maybe that we don't use these particular gates. What's the other reason? Inefficiency, right? What do you think the heart rate was of John Cleese when he finished this particular sequence, right? Okay. Lots of interesting questions we can ask about bipedal locomotion. You all have decades of experience. What part, if any, does the upper body play in bipedal locomotion? You all should know. Absolutely, right? So there's something about your upper body that keeps your center of mass from moving outside your center of support. If it does, didn't, you'd end up working for the Ministry of Silly Walks. In using, I guess, like your arms, you can kind of generate more forward momentum as well. You can use your arms to generate forward momentum. Yes. What other purpose does your arms, do your arms serve for bipedal locomotion? Kind of like a counterweight to your like legs that you're like moving. They're, they're a counter, not necessarily a counterweight. You use your arms obvious, you pump your arms obviously when you're running. Don't try this with anyone watching, but try running and not moving your arms. It's not gonna end well for you. What? What is it that your arms are doing during running? Keeping your momentum. Keeping your momentum? Mm, you can keep your momentum without, it's not quite, not quite that. Thinking about thinking is misleading, right? You've been doing this for decades. You've been using your arms to do this particular uh, necessity during running, although you might not have been aware of it. When you're running and your stance foot, the moment your stance foot leaves the ground, there is a huge impulse force coming from that side of the body, the body of the stance foot, pushing you forward from this side of the body. What's gonna start happening to your body in the air if you don't move your arms? You're gonna to start to rotate about your long axis you may not be aware of it, but when you're pumping your arms in opposition, you are exerting a huge amount of torque, rotational force, in the other direction. And those two torques cancel themselves out, so you're not running like this, and again, ending up working for the Ministry of Silly Walks. Yeah? You've done this your whole life. You might not have been aware that, you, that you're doing it, right? You've already seen multiple times in this course, thinking about abstract cognition is misleading, right? What we think we're doing when we're playing chess or writing poetry or writing cursive is often not what's actually going on. Same thing with arguably non-cognitive behaviors like locomotion, yeah, kind of interesting. Okay, okay. 
Again, legged locomotion is something that roboticists have been working on for a long time. Before Big Dog and the Atlas humanoid robot, this was the state of the art. This is the Asimo robot. This is the Asimo robot uh, released uh, in the early 90s and improved throughout the 90s into the 2000s. Another candidate, another candidate employee for the Ministry of Silly Walks. You're all laughing. Why are you laughing? What is it that's so funny about this particular gate? One thing that looks like it's crouching as it runs. It is crouching while it runs. Why? Lower center of gravity, which is a good thing, yeah? So it doesn't tip over as much. If it wasn't crouching, then it would um, kind of fall because it's turning every single time and it does the um, thing because uh, it's not moving and using the arms as counterforce. Yeah, that's a little trickier, right? So they hadn't figured out how to get the arms to, count, to counteract torque in this case. They claim, they claim that Asimo is running here. Technically speaking, it is not running. Why not? Recall our discussion about legged locomotion. There's no, flight phase. there's no flight phase, right? If you look carefully, there is no period in which both legs are off the ground. I forget how much Asimo weighs, but it's, it's up there, several hundred pounds. So imagine debugging and working on this machine. You don't want to be trying to create a machine that's partly working, that's throwing its entire weight into the air. So they came up with an algorithm where it's actually, it's walking, it's keeping its center of mass over its polygon of support at all time. It's just fast walking. For a lot of periods of time, the center of mass is not quite just one foot, it's one in a bit but it's basically keeping its center of mass over, uh, over its feet as it goes, pretty stable. It's wearing this, uh, this uh, fashionable little silver backpack. What do you think's in the backpack? No battery. battery, right? There, this machine is not designed to exploit the dynamics of its body. The engineers, and this is it was and is an amazing engineering achievement of the time, it is fighting against a lot of the things that in us, in us bipeds, Mother Nature didn't fight against, she exploited instead. Yeah? So uh, on terms, in terms of the four desiderata for, for bipedal locomotion, uh, despite some, uh, it's, it's really an energy hog, not doing so well in terms of energy efficiency. Yeah. Let's look at another machine now. This machine strikes uh, as opposite a trade-off as possible. This is about as far from Asimo as you can get in terms of bipedal locomotion. <coughs> Tell me about this machine. What's happening here? How is this machine managing to walk? It's like it's swinging its arms to counter the weight. Yep. Weight. Yeah, absolutely. So it's 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 definitely using its arms. It may be a little bit difficult to see, but the the uh, arms are swinging in antiphase with one another. And the contralateral arm, so the arm on the other side of the body, left leg, right arm, right leg, left arm, contralateral arms are moving in phase with that leg on the other side. So it's canceling a little bit of the torque like we just talked about. What else can you tell me about this machine? How is it managing bipedal locomotion? It's leaning a little bit forward, yep. It's using its momentum a little bit. It's using its momentum. Again, we do that too, right? You lean forward a little bit, and gravity will pull you forward. You can get gravity to do a little bit of the work for you, yep. This machine is exploiting a lot of the interactions between itself and its, and its environment to achieve bipedal, bipedalism. Is it like swinging its legs forward? 
It is swinging its legs forward. So like us, the swing leg is relaxed when it's swinging. Yeah, it's acting like a pendulum. What else? What else is going on here? What do you what, what do you think about the energy efficiency of this machine? Is it using a lot of power to move? It's pretty energy efficient here. The motors, whatever they are, they're not having to do much work. Well, where are the motors here? Do you see the motors? What about the sensors? What about the electronics? What about the batteries? Where are they? There aren't any. Yeah. Arguably, this isn't even a robot. It's a mechanism, right? No sensors, no motors, no electronics. It's almost like a magic trick, right? How is this possible? It's falling. Ah, it's falling. It's on a slightly declined plane. It's placed at the upper back end of this plane, and it's controlled falling down this declined plane. Yeah? This machine as, is as about energy efficient as you can possibly be. So it's doing really, 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 really well at one of the four desiderata, which means it has to be giving up in terms of some of the other three. What? What is it giving up? Robustness. Robustness. This machine cannot walk on flat ground. Right? The energy input to the system is coming from outside. When we play, again, remember, recall your high school physics. We start by putting this machine at the top of this decline plane, which means we're giving it some potential energy. And then this mechanism is converting that potential energy into kinetic energy, into motion. Yeah? Very efficient, but it can only walk in a very, very narrow range of environments. Yeah? The opposite of Asimo and Big Dog with its diesel engine. OK, but where do we go from here at this very extreme end? We can move on to, and we'll see another, uh, we're going to see an evolutionary robotics experiment in a moment with evolving a passive dynamic walker, something that is passive, it's not active, it has no actuators. We're going to evolve it into a hybrid dynamic walker. A hybrid dynamic walker does have motors, but those motors only have a part-time job. They're not always on like the muscles in your legs. So in a hybrid dynamic walker, during part of the gait cycle, the joint is powered by a motor. The rest of the time, the motor shuts off, and the joint is free to swing, is free to swing, turning the leg into a pendulum. Here's uh, the first hybrid dynamic walker that was ever made uh, at a lab in the Netherlands. It's a little difficult to see in this video. There's a bunch of other videos of this machine online you can go have a look at. When do you think, in the, in the legs at least, when do you think the motors apply a force? And when do they shut off? Now you can use your own physiology to try and figure this out. Seems like when the motors would apply the force, when the foot is in contact with the ground. When the foot is in contact with the ground, the foot is in contact with the ground for half of the gait cycle. When, during that stance phase, when that foot is on the ground, when should the motors apply a force, do you think? When the foot is under the center of the mass. When it's under the center of mass, maybe. When do you tense and push with the muscles in your leg during walking? You've been doing this for decades. You're not sure, eh? Is it as soon as the foot is on the ground? 
Uh, it can be, so if, you're if your knee is not locked, you tense your muscles to cushion the blow. You can also obviously lock your knee and not have to rely on that as much. So there's a little bit of work that your muscles can do during that part of the gait cycle, but that's not where you actually need to do the work. When it's behind you. When it's behind you. The moment that your stance foot is about to become your flight foot, is about to leave the ground, you give a little kick with your foot and your ankle and your toes, right? A little bit of push forward, then everything shuts off and the leg becomes a pendulum. Same thing with our hybrid dynamic walker here. The moment the back stance foot is about to leave the ground, there's a little motor uh, in the hips here that gives a push forward to that leg. It starts the pendulum swinging forward. This robot has an empty, has an empty bucket on its head. Why? Roboticists are not without a little sense of humor. Why the empty bucket? No brain. No brain. There's a little bit of a brain. There's a very small microcontroller in the hips that is sensing and determining when to give, the, give this little impulse force, this little kick as the leg is leaving. But it's very, very simple. It's about 14 lines of code. If you get the body right, you can get away with very, very simple neural control. This is a concept that we will sort of see in passing in this course, but not really talk about. This is an idea known as morphological, morphological computation. The body itself, ah, I apologize. The body itself, uh, the body itself can take over some of the computation that would have to be done by the brain if the body is not made correctly, yeah? Whatever computation is, it may be something that actually can be traded back and forth between body and brain. This is an idea that's just now starting to become popular in robotics, and what exactly does this mean? How do you measure computation? What does it mean for computation to happen in the body? The, the hybrid dynamic walker, when you compare it against Asimo, sort of gives this intuitive sense of what morphological computation is. Yeah. You can make a passive dynamic walker yourself with a piece of paper. Or if you've got a ladder at home, this video is three minutes long. This ladder just keeps going. Passive dynamic walking, not hybrid dynamic walking, right? Declined plane. Okay. Okay. So we're going to look now at this particular uh, evolutionary robotics experiment. The investigators in this case asked the following uh, research question. Can, designing a passive dynam dynamic walker is actually very difficult. The little toy examples I just showed you makes it seem like it's relatively simple. It's actually not. Why is it very, why do you think it's not intuitive or difficult to design a passive dynamic walker? We're not programming it. We're not giving it a neural network. So it's all got to be the body. What is it that makes it so difficult? Why is it that these investigators are going to hand over the job to an evolutionary algorithm to design the body to do passive to do passive dynamic walking? It could be. There, there might be lo loads, lots of local optima there. You might get stuck with a passive dynamic walker that, like the, uh, like the ladder, takes very small steps. There's some hints in this video. Why is designing a passive dynamic walker so difficult? Why is the human walking right next to this machine? 
It's not very stable, right? How many times do you think they shot this video before they got one that, that actually worked? You know? Look at the, it may be difficult to see in the back. The legs, or sorry, the feet, the underside of the feet have a very specific curvature. I actually uh, worked at the lab next to this lab in Cornell. A lot of the grad students that worked in this uh, lab were bike junkies. They were into bicycles and gears and fixing things. They'd spend huge amounts of time with an exacto blade, shaving off very small bits of rubber to get this curvature exactly right. Very, very difficult to design this mechanism to be exactly right so that you get passive dynamic walking. So let's turn it over to an evolutionary algorithm. That's the first question they asked. And again, we wouldn't be talking about this paper if the answer wasn't yes. We'll see how they did this in a moment. They then went on to a second phase of this experiment and asked a second question, which is, if the evolutionary algorithm can evolve a passive dynamic walker, can they then continue the evolutionary algorithm and evolve the passive dynamic walker into a hybrid dynamic walker? They're going to obviously have to start to make some changes in that second phase of the experiment, like what? Any ideas? You have to add motors. You're going to have to obviously add motors. You're going to have to put the machine on a, a flat ground rather than a declined plane. The passive dynamic walker only works on a declined plane. We want to evolve hybrid dynamic walking. So in essence, what we're going to ask the evolutionary algorithm to do is evolve a machine that strikes a very extreme balance between high efficiency and very, uh, very low robustness. It only works on this declined plane. Give up, and then in the second part of the experiment, give up a little bit of efficiency, add some motors, and start to apply some power, but increase robustness a little bit. Widen the range of environments in which this newly evolved machine can work. So far, so good? All right, let's dive in. Here's the machine, uh, not so surprisingly, uh, looks like a biped. No upper body in this case, so the legs are gonna have to do all the work here. Nothing too uh, surprising for us here. We've got a hip joint. At that hip joint, uh, there are two motors, one for this degree of freedom, one for this degree of freedom, one hinge joint in the knee, two hinge joints in the ankle, one for this degree of freedom, one for this degree of freedom. So we've got five joints on this side of the body, five on this, got a total of 10 joints so far. No motors, no sensors, right? Pass we're just doing passive dynamic walking. They add, they're gonna add a bunch of mass blocks. You can think of these as sort of lead cubes, weights that they put to the body. <coughs> They're gonna allow the evolutionary algorithm to move the positions of these weights around the body of the passive walker to alter the mass distribution of the body. Okay, here's all of this put together. We've got our uh, left leg, right leg. Uh, all the red parts are the masses. Uh, here are all the parameters that they're gonna turn over to the evolutionary algorithm. They're gonna package all of these variables together in a vector, which becomes the genotype, the vector of numbers that the evolutionary algorithm is going to evolve. So the evolutionary algorithm is gonna be able to alter the mass of the weight, mass of the thigh up here, mass uh, of the foot. Uh, the evolutionary algorithm can alter the uh, leg segment length, so how tall or how short is this machine. It's also able to evolve the x, y, uh, the offset of these masses. So how far forward on the leg or how far backward on the leg are these masses being placed? Uh, the length of the foot can be evolved, the radius of the waist, and finally b sub y up here, which is the starting hip angle of the right leg. Why are they evolving that? Why not just take the biped, the biped with whatever it's evolved 
parameters are and put it at the top of the deep quine plane and give it a little bit of a push. Because you kind of have to have this, you have to have it almost starting in the gate or else there would, there's no motor to like kick one leg forward. Or Absolutely, right? If both legs start on the ground, there's nothing you can do, right? So we're going to start our machine with its one of its legs out in front of it at some evolved angle. What that angle should be, who knows? Let's let the evolutionary algorithm figure it out. Okay. Here's another mechanical detail we haven't seen before either. They also added, uh, they also added a number of springs to the robot. Let's start with the foot. This one's a little bit easier. So they're attaching a spring on the outside of the foot to the outside uh, of the shin, uh, outside of the lower leg, a second spring to the front of the foot attaching to the lower leg uh, as well, and then an additional two springs in the hip. So we've got one, two, uh, one, two, three, four springs on one side of the body, and one, two, three, four, another set of springs on the other side of the body. It says here actuator or motor, forget that for a moment, that'll come back into play when we look at the hybrid dynamic walker. These are just springs. Springs have a number of features uh, describing them, but you can boil those features down into just two features, the stiffness and the damping coefficient of the spring. If there's any mechanical engineers here, my apologies, it's gonna be remedial for you, but some computer scientists may not have come across this before. The evolutionary algorithm is going to be free to set the stiffness and damping coefficient of each of these four springs. So on one side of the body, there's eight parameters, stiffness and damping of each of these four springs, and the same thing on the other side of the body. What is stiffness? Uh, what is stiffness? It's kind of intuitive. It's how much a spring resists being pulled away from its resting length or pushed away from its resting length. Yeah? Damping is when a spring is away from its resting length, the length that it likes to be, how long or how will it return to that resting length when whatever the force that was pushing or pulling on it goes away. Yeah? Easiest way to think about this is to look at my very pretty pictures here. Here's an example of a spring with high stiffness and high damping. So the vertical axis here is representing on the upper half here how much the spring is pulled beyond its resting length, and the lower half of the panel here is representing lengths that are shorter than its resting length. So in this example here, we've pulled the spring away from its resting length, but not by that much. It's stiff, it's got high stiffness, so it's resisting being pulled away, and I then let go of the spring, and it starts to do what springs do, is uh, decrease and increase its length. But it very quickly in time, which is the horizontal axis here, it very quickly in time comes back to its resting length. Let's take the same high stiff spring, but now give it a low damping coefficient. Same thing, I'm gonna pull it away from its resting length, I'm gonna elongate the spring and then let go, and this spring bounces back and forth for a very, very, very long time. If you ever played with a slinky, that's kind of what a slinky is. It's got low damping, yeah? Low stiffness, it's relatively easy to push or pull the, the spring away from its resting length represented by the high amplitude oscillations here. Low stiffness, high damping. I pull it a long way from its resting length, but when I let go, it, rel the, it relatively dampens out that perturbation and returns to its resting length. Low stiffness, low damping. This is a slinky, something that's relatively easy to elongate and it bounces around forever. So far, so good. Okay, I mentioned this is a passive dynamic walker. It's almost a passive dynamic walker with one 
uh, one exception here. When they, take, uh, when they take the machine and they put it at the top of the declined plane, they rotate one of the legs out away from the robot, they're going to allow some motors to give a single uh, instantaneous push to the robot. The muscles or the motors in the robot are going to actuate for just one time step, and then they're going to go silent for the rest of the simulation. So not quite a passive dynamic walker. It's a little bit of a hybrid dynamic walker. This, when we get to evolving it to actually act as a full hybrid dynamic walker, you're going to see that it's controlled by a continuous time neural network. Um, there are no recurrent connections in this network, so it's not a CTRNN. It's just a CTNN. In this first phase, when they're going to allow the motors to actuate for just one time step, they're going to use just one part of the neural network. They're going to use the motors here. Here's the motor layer here. Here's the input layer with all the sensors, which we assumed are shut off for now. You'll notice that there are five motors. Uh, and just to remind you, we've got uh, sorry, we've got our springs here. We've got one, two, three, four springs. And I'm sorry, I forgot to mention there's a fifth spring in the knee as well. Yeah, five springs. The motors in this experiment are not attached to the joints. The motors are attached to the springs. So the motors in this case are going to either push or pull on the spring. Yeah, makes sense. This is actually also closer to human physiology. How so? Uh, muscles push and pull. On what? Spring. They actually only pull. Muscles never push, but they pull on. The skeleton. They don't pull on the skeleton directly. Tendons. Tendons. Yeah, your tendons are springy. They have stiffness and damping coefficients. There's a good reason for motors or muscles not to pull on the rigid parts of the machine or the animal directly, but to pull on a spring, and the spring pulls on the rigid parts. Why? The damping will stop it from like snapping something. Snapping, yeah. It doesn't feel so good when something pulls directly. When your tendons stiffen up as you get older, it's not, not, so, not so much fun, yeah? Okay. All right, so we've got five motors on one side of the body, pulling or pushing on the five springs. The springs are attached to the body. The joints are passive, yeah? Like whatever it was, assignment two or three in your case, yeah? Okay. Uh, we'll talk about the central pattern generators in a moment. Uh, what am I missing here? Uh, oh, yeah. Um, okay, so the central pattern generator, let's finish with that today, I think. The central pattern generator, as we'll see when we get to the hybrid dynamic walking part of this experiment, is, uh, is a special kind of neuron up here, almost like the bias neuron, but in the central pattern generator case, it emits a one briefly, and then starts to emit zeros. Zero, 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 one, zero, 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 one, zero, 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 one. So it's a pattern generator. It's generating a pattern of activation at a regular frequency. Yeah. In the first set of this experiment, the CPG, the central pattern generator, is only going to be allowed to emit one pulse to the five motors, which are then going to pull and push on the five springs for a short period of time, and then everything is going to shut off, and it's going to become a passive dynamic walker. Yeah? You, all, uh, you and most higher animals have central pattern generators in our spinal cord. Uh, you've probably heard the story about a chicken with its head cut off will continue running for a considerable period of time. In the chicken and in you, most of the timing of walking and running is actually being controlled by a conductor not in your head, but a conductor in your spine. There is something that is sending out 
regular neural activations at a regular frequency. Most of the time for us, that frequency is, this is kind of the magic frequency. We mentioned it last class. One hertz, yeah? Okay, I think we will pause there for today. You have a quiz due tonight. My PhD student at TUSA will be here on Thursday, guest lecturing. I will see you all again in a week's time. Have a good one.